welcome again to Ideas at Work and Beyond, the sometimes unruly roundtable discussion of local Connecticut politics. Now, when we say Ideas at Work and Beyond, we can cover the uh, earthquake in Haiti. We can cover uh, local issues affecting the Roman Catholic Church. We can cover local dance troops. I, you know, we have to answer on this very show, Ideas at Work and Beyond. So it's a broad spectrum. There's a lot going on. Uh, but today, we're going to dedicate, to the sh- dedicate the show to the state conventions. Why, you ask? Because there's a lot going on. It's riveting. There's a lot of candidates. There's a lot of people coming and going. And your intrepid reporters, me, the humble co-host. Can we say co-host now? Yeah, co-host. Of this it sounds show. good. Um, I was at the Republican convention, and we have some live footage of that. Well, it was live at the time, I guess, at this point. It's taped. And Al Robinson was also down the hall in the next ballroom over or after we were done. I forget how it all worked, but he was at the Democratic Love Fest that was a convention <laughs> because everyone's giddy and excited like little schoolgirls about their uh, incumbent candidates and how they're going to win and raise all this money, and they're excited. The problem is that the electorate as a whole is unhappy. They're unhappy at the runaway spending that's going on both in Hartford and in Washington as political cronyism reaches a new high. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Sure we'll, get a, we'll, we'll get to all that with Al Robinson's report on the Democratic Convention. This weekend coming up, there's a couple things. A few frivolous. The uh, New York Mets continue their rebound as they ousted the New York Yankees. Beat the Phillies, and, and beat the Yankees. Beat the Yankees, beat the Phillies. Uh, I was actually had the benefit of being down at City Field last night. Um, really? And, uh, yeah, it was very exciting. I asked Dave if he wanted to go, but Dave told me to go pound salt because he had to move. Why didn't you call he, me? He had, I, he didn't I call me either. I should have called both of you guys, but Dave, Dave said he had to move. He had to, like, fill boxes or something like that, which to me is the equivalent of I had to wash my hair if you're asking a girl out for a date. But anyways, uh, there will be other Mets games, and Dave is invited. He's coming out of the okay. studio. This could be, all right, do we have security? All right, but um, so the Mets have rebounded, and the Chicago Blackhawks, the mighty Chicago Blackhawks, who have not won a Stanley Cup since 1961. But in Chicago, that's not bad, because the uh, Chicago Cubs haven't won a World <laughs> Series since I think it was 1908 or something like that. And, uh, but the Chicago Blackhawks have made it into the Stanley Cup Finals against the Philadelphia Flyers. That game, that, that series starts on Saturday. And we'll report it back to you because we're big, Ga- we're big Chicago Blackhawks fans. But first, I want to go through a series of, of uh, political um, cartoons related to Memorial Day. If we can roll those, I think each one is poignant because this weekend is Memorial Day weekend. And we start, uh, if we can roll those, uh, those Memorial Day cartoons, each one of them hit me. Hamburgers, Bratfords, hot dogs, is there anything I forgot? And in that case, they did forget the men and women who, even as we speak right now, are fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq for our freedom. The next one shows a guy playing golf, which isn't a bad thing. But remember, on Memorial Day. The next one with the flag, today's call, color alert, red, white, and blue, in memory of all who have sacrificed. This weekend, take time to reflect. Thanksgiving is a day when we pause to give thanks for things we have. Memorial Day is when we pause to give thanks for the people who fought for the things we have. And how true that is. Freedom is not free. Um, And this one talks about uh, you need to just say thanks as you're going about your busy day. I like the next one. The price of hot dogs, the price of gasoline, and the price of freedom. Things to remember on Memorial Day. If you've had a chance to watch that uh, series on HBO called The Pacific, I think you say what dear a price is paid. And I'd like to introduce a real American Idol, and there's an old guy uh, pointing to a grave. And then the final one I want to show is when the American flag marches by on the Memorial Day parades, it is customary and it is fitting to stand. And the last one shows that the only one standing was the man in a wheelchair. So, a salute to our uh, veterans. We thank you. We appreciate your service. And uh, each successive generation is called upon to once again defend freedom. So we salute you and we appreciate your service. Memorial Day weekend coming up. Okay, without any further ado, there's been a lot of exciting stuff going on. It looks like Congressman Chris Shays 
has just endorsed Mike Fideli. If we have that graphic, we can show. And then a local politician, Mark Bouton, is firmly in the Mike Fideli camp. The Republican team, we need to stop out of control spending and get Connecticut's economy back on track. If we have those photos, we'll put those up as well. And that will begin, there it is, Mark Bouton. This is a mailer that's going out. He is, Marty, that uh, mailer went out two weeks ago. It's old news now. Well, it got in, it got in my, uh, it got in my mailbox today, so I thought we would roll that. But anyways, we have Matt Grimes <sighs> and we have Al Robinson that have joined the roundtable discussion. And Al, what do you have from the? Oh, well, you didn't wish me happy birthday. Is today your birthday? No, it was Tuesday, but that's all right. Tuesday. So what? Are you, Twenty-nine. And Thirty-one. Thirty-one. I know. Mm -hmm. I was close. Well, happy birthday. We're glad you made it to. Uh, Thank you. It's nice to be. I need to make one other correction too. You Go know, right ahead. I'll talk. You, know, you mentioned Democrats giddy over incumbents, candidate. Well, there's only one incumbent on the Democratic state ticket, and that's uh, Denise Nap Napier. Uh, there's a whole new slate on both sides, Absolutely. and I think that's very uh, unique. So it's we're not. So uh, what's Jim Hart? What's Jim, Chris Murray? Uh, neither of those Murphy. are either of those statewide candidates, Marty. No, I know, I know why I'm not talking That's about what you said. You're, they were giddy over their statewide incumbents, and they only have one, right? I stand corrected. Let me hit them with that. I, I stand corrected. That. It isn't statewide incumbents. It is uh, local uh, congressional races where they have incumbents, and they're very excited about it. Although I think, I, I view Blumenthal as a de facto incumbent because he's so well-known in the state. No, very well-known, huh? Very, very well-known. Well running for a, running for a totally different office, though. Very totally well different known. office. Okay, well, you were at the Democratic Convention. Yeah. Uh, we have some videotape of the Democratic and the Republican Convention. Yeah. Well, why don't you first give me your feedback, and what do you think we need to know? Well, here's one thing on both conventions, and this is based upon my understanding of conventions, seeing how the floor stuff goes on. I really don't think that conventions are reflective of the will of the voters. Well, not necessarily. Not, not, well, and I'll explain why. Mm -hmm. um, let's say it's voting day and you go in to vote and you cast your vote. You can't turn around a few minutes later and say, oh, wait a second, I want to change my vote. You can do this at these conventions. And not only that, the arm twisting that goes on, and you know it as a delegate, I, I and I'm sure it. you know it as well, the arm twisting that goes on to change your vote is just absolutely it's amazing. When I watch the Republicans... McMahon and Simmons, and I saw those Simmons votes switching over to McMahon. You can see these blue shirts just running all over the place, uh -huh. you know, twisting arms. Is that really reflective of the people and the will of the people? Not at all. Not at all. And I think that's one, some of the problems with these conventions. We've seen the same thing um, with the Democrats um, at their convention. Um, uh, Secretary of State Jerry Garcia, um, Denise Merrill. Willing and Dilling, I mean, drawing, drawing, drawing Denise Merrill under the bus, in essence. Uh, <laughs> the way he done it, he did it. Uh -huh. I, I really don't have enough time to explain how conventions are done and how, you know, when, when you give up your votes and tell them to switch over to another person. But just, if you understand it, you'll understand that Jerry Garcia did something that really took people aback. And I know Denise Merrill didn't feel very happy about it, <laughs> you know. And the fact that Denise Merrill eventually won that thing. She's got the asterisk next to her name. Yeah. I'm sure you'll be hearing some, uh, there's some behind the scenes dirty stuff going on. Well, give us a synopsis. But what happened in layman's term? In 30 it, it, seconds or less, what went it's down? It's so, maybe you can explain it a little better, but it's really difficult to explain the inside, in and out st stuff that goes on right, in the well, floor. But again, it just, it, it, just, it just tells you that they're not reflective of the will of the people, which but is why I'm so upset that Rob Simmons dropped out of the race. This way, I don't I think it's fair. Al, if I, could, if I could kind of elaborate a little bit further. Somebody can't go to the voting booth with you when you vote on election day. Exactly. They can't be over your shoulder saying, don't do that, erase that, right. do this, that, and the other thing and everything. And once it goes into the thing, it's counted. You can't pull it back out and yeah. play with it again. And everybody stands shoulder to shoulder and everything. And there's, there's, there can be manipulation. There can be arm twisting. There can be a lot of uh, people voting a certain way just to get out of the place by the end of yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there, exactly. Can be, there can be all of this stuff that goes on at conventions. There can be Convention, shady stuff that goes on when people leave. Con conventions, I'll say, forget about whether it's good, bad, or different. Mm -hmm. Conventions is one step in the process. It's not the be-all, end-all. Mm -hmm. I don't like when people say, so-and-so shouldn't primary because it will divide the party. No. Convention... Uh, is one step in the process. So is primary one step in the process. The final process will come down to November 2nd. Okay, so let's take one of these races. you got Linda McMahon, you have Rob Simmons, who's been a guest on this show on numerous occasions, mm -hmm. and you have Oz... No, no, Peter Schiff. Come on. Peter, okay. Schiff. Peter Schiff. Come on. My bad, my bad. Peter Schiff. 
Okay, so you have these three candidates. Right. Mm-hmm. Linda McMahon wins in a squeaker at the convention, and Rob Simmons automatically or, or quickly drops out. And now Peter Schiff, I think, is battling to get, he's going to continue the primary fight. Does any of this make sense? Well, it, it, it does in, in this regard. I mean, Al and I talked on this show before Christmas time about how it was about those delegates. Not only how many you could get, mm-hmm. but how many, uh, how committed they were. Right. I mean, and I promise you, Rob Simmons started Friday with more delegates pledged to him than Linda McMahon oh, did. Yeah. We know that We know that he started the day that we know that it's, it's documented every place. Um, the uh, what happened was she spent 14 million dollars. I mean, she got at the end of it what 707 delegates, 14 million divided by 700. I mean, that's how much per delegate she spent. I mean, that's that's an insane amount of money to spend on a convention. Mm-hmm. She essentially ran or, or has been running the campaign uh, for the Republican nomination that John Corzine ran to become senator in New Jersey and then to become governor in New Jersey. She is trying to buy that office and. Part of it, the money she spent, paid off at the convention on uh, last Friday night, which is why half the hall emptied once she cleared 50%. Because uh, the Simmons delegates that hung in with him were very diehard, were very committed to him, uh, wow. believed that the, uh, he was the best qualified candidate. I think Al Robinson would agree that he was, is the best qualified candidate of the three for the Republican nomination. Yeah, absolutely. Without and, question. And Without question. Uh, what happened to him? You. you you saw the second district. When I started seeing the results from the second district, some people changing their votes from the second district. I was like, "Wow, yeah. that's a real scumbag move that's I mean, no, going no, no, on there." It wasn't so much that; it was that they drew, the, lo- they drew the lottery for the congressional districts. Right. And when the right. second district was last, I, and everybody was saying, "Wow, if the second district had been drawn first, you would have had a different outcome, and he probably would have cleared 50% yeah. on the first ballot." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me be the devil's advocate on a couple of these things. First of all, the conventions are are, are duly. Uh, um, uh, recognized Republicans that are involved in the Republican Party in their various communities. They, many of them were elected to the town committees of the various communities. So there is some reflection. I mean, there has to be some mechanism by which you know uh, uh, these candidates are endorsed by the convention. And if people don't like the outcome of the convention, if, at least if they've had some support, unlike Rob Merkel, who we'll get to, didn't get the 15%, Jesus. but um, the, uh, they have the right to so primary. So I think the whole process is somewhat democratic. And it may be long and cumbersome, and uh, and but it's you know our system, and it seems to work. And if you if you look at it too, this is a very very unique time. Regardless, we should make a very global statement here that this is the first time since 1994 where we're going to have a couple of statewide primaries that actually mean something. I mean, Republicans will go to the polls on uh, August 10th, and they'll choose candidates for governor, lieutenant governor, United States senator, and if you live in the fifth district, Congress. Um, if uh, uh, what, what else? Attorney General AG. and um, a lot of the local judge of probates are, are going to primary. For the Democrats statewide, they'll choose a governor, they'll choose a lieutenant governor, uh, they'll choose uh, a secretary of the state, they'll choose a comptroller, and in many cases they also have judge of probate primaries. And mm-hmm. if you live in Danbury, uh, part of Bethel, Sherman, and Fairfield, you'll also choose a state senate candidate in that primary. Mm-hmm. So, so this is wide open. Wide open. Th- 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 this is, I mean, if you were going to go to a state convention, this is the one to go to. Yeah, I mean, this happens once every four years. I mean, if, if, uh, if a Republican or Democrat gets elected governor this uh-huh. year, whichever party, that party's convention four years from now will probably be a fait accompli to renominate them with a bang of the gavel and the secretary casting one vote. We don't have these very often. We had them in 94. Um, right. We have them here 16 years later. Um, but this is going to be a very year. that This process is wide open. Uh, there's a lot to be decided between now and August 10th. A lot can change. Um, and I think that everybody's got to pay attention. If you're unaffiliated, you can register to vote in one of the Republican primaries or the Democratic primaries. You can switch back the day after. But this is where... Uh, this is very, very important. Memorial Day weekend at the parades and such, we're going to see candidates. Every place we go, we're oh, going yeah. to see candidates. This Check, we'll wait till Monday. And there'll be also <laughs> guys out with, uh, with uh, clipboards trying to get signatures on their on their various petitions. Which is their right, too. That's right. They didn't okay. have before. I mean, it used to be you had to get 15% of that convention. Now you can go in your district or throughout the state and get 5% of the party registration. Although you don't have a lot of time. You don't no. have a lot of time to get those signatures. You have some videotape. You yeah, well, why don't, we, why, don't we run with, why don't we run with yours first because okay. yours is pretty good. So um, from this weekend, I think it is uh, Dave, it's uh, 1B in the back there. Uh, this is video footage from Marty's um, experience at the Republican uh, State Convention, which was at the Convention Center in Hartford. Oh, yes. Convention Center in Hartford. So uh, 
if we are this I believe actually is the fourth district convention though isn't it that we're talking no, this is this is everything this is the the whole two days no, no, Marty's footage okay if oh we, we have everything yeah, we, got, we, we, run, run, we run, sampled run. a lot so please run the footage please or should we play, do some uh, finger tricks here today? Yeah. Town committee picnic. I haven't been to all the, um, you know, DTCs over the years. I've been doing other things. I started up a policy center at Central. We've been working on job creation. So I got into this race about six months ago. Ray, I've had a little bit of catching up to do. I've been to as many town committees as I could. I've been respectful of the process, respectful of the uh, folks here, the delegates. You know, these are the activists that really energize the party. And now I'm looking forward to the chance to talk to the voters. And this is what we did for years ago. We won that primary. Look, we found out four years ago. You know, we like to break news here on Ideas of Work and Beyond. And we are the first media outlet to let you know that Ned Lamont has actually switched his party affiliation. He is now a right-wing Republican. He's coming out strong. I understand there will be a fundraiser by Sarah Palin uh, in Greenwich. Now, that's unconfirmed, but Ned Lamont will have a fundraiser featuring Sarah Palin. A lot of people don't know that. You heard it first here on Ideas of War. He had a better chance of Rob Merkel storming that convention. <laughs> Actually, no, and I was just kidding. We hit the wrong button, and uh, I think we're going to be ready now to go to the Republican read clear thing. This is a Republican uh, convention. convention. We'll break it down and uh, got the press back there. And we'll break it down and uh, show you how this all works. But it is a uh, a bit of an adventure right now. I've got to look for the Ridgefield group. They keep running away from me, but they're around here somewhere. Should be exciting. Here we are. There's a breakout now convention. I find this pretty interesting. Uh, Linda McMahon campaign has practically their own uh, television crew here, and they're working. And the breakout is coming down here, where you go into these rooms. It takes all kinds at these conventions. But I just want to point out here, this is how this whole system works. Oh, I don't know. You got the Linda McMahon campaign, then walking down here through a sea of faces. You then have the Peter Schiff campaign. You come in here. Happens. There's a lineup. I'm going to try and break my way through. You have all these lovely women that are carrying beers. You'll notice that. And then they're signed up. This is where the votes are really counted. You have an open bar here, which is great. And then Peter Schiff, signing books, right here. If nothing else, he's selling books, which is a positive thing. And then you, you, you come over here, and uh, this is where the hobnobbing goes on. He's apparently selling uh, some kind of a, got all the Snickers you could possibly have and box lunches. We'll continue. This is American politics. We're going to the best one, though, which is going to be at Mike Fidelli's Grill. Is what you're supposed to do anyway. I mean, it's like, you know, what, the way it was originally described, it was like, well, and, and assuming I've, I've now found out that the driver's license qualifies as a citizen, because initially I wasn't sure if it did, because who cares, you know, who walks around with a passport? I mean, you know, but I do know that if you, if you are not a legal citizen, right, if you have to be here, you actually have to acquire a carry ID. Right. right. So it's not like we're asking you to do something that you're not required to do anyway. Do I think that we're going to solve our nation's problems? No. I mean, the thing about immigration is that's not the problem. Yes, it's a problem, but it's not the problem. And it's not a panacea. And I know that there's a general all around the world, whenever there's a country, whenever there's a problem, people tend to try to blame it on the state, try to blame it on the foreigners. We did this for ourselves. Washington. 
So this is going to be for the show. How do you think uh, Linda's doing so far in the uh, in the campaign and what's going on? What do you see unfolding here? It, it, all, it, it all depends on one vote from Richfield. <laughs> really? We're waiting on one vote from Richfield to see where this guy goes. One delegate. He's an important delegate. Really? Who could literally make this make or break Linda tonight. So, okay. What he's talking about is he, he wants me to vote for Linda McMahon, and, and we'll have to see how this whole thing squares out. But this is certainly a nice spread, and now back to the show. You've been on the show a number of times. You're here at the Republican convention. How's it looking? It's looking good. We got a lot of energy here. We got people that have come out for the first time. We're hustling the votes. We're hustling the numbers. We think we're going to be over the top before midnight. Okay, so Attorney General Blumenthal claimed that he was in Vietnam. You have some ribbons. I'm going to ask you. I know you don't want to volunteer it, but I'm going to ask you. Could you show us those ribbons? Yes, I will. These, these show that I was in Vietnam because that's a campaign ribbon with four campaign stars, and that's a Vietnam service ribbon that stand for the medals that I was awarded for serving in Vietnam. Okay, so Blumenthal... I keep them safe in my Constitution, which is what we were fighting for, freedom and democracy. Well, listen, as you get the nomination, are we going to see you on the show again? You're going to see me on the show so much, so it's going to be really fun. Thank okay, you. good luck. God bless. We're here with Peter Schiff. We're on the floor of the Republican convention. You're an outsider. What did you think happened when the, when the stock market went down 400 points the day before yesterday? Sign of things to come. Is this another prediction that you've made? Well, I'm, we're in a bear market. We're going to be in a bear market for a long time, okay. especially in terms of gold. How is but, it? Go ahead. But I was say, I, hopefully I'm not going to be the outsider. I need to be the upset. You know, people, I'm the underdog in this convention. But you never know. Sometimes America loves an underdog. I'm the best candidate. Maybe this convention will surprise some people and back the Tea Parties in the state of Connecticut, stand with the people, and nominate me to be the Republican nominee for the United States Senate in Connecticut. Great. We're here with Mike McLaughlin, state senator and uh, representative in Danbury. Uh, how, do you th how do you see the convention going so far? Oh, it's been pretty exciting. The 5th District uh, uh, convention was uh, very exciting. Sam Calagiri took 67% of the vote. I think a lot of people thought it was much closer. Uh, Justin Bernier did a really fine job in the campaign looking to uh, gather support. Uh, I endorse Sam, and I'm very excited with the outcome. Hopefully we won't have a primary. I think tonight is going to be even more exciting when we look at the U.S. Senate race. That's very close uh, for the nomination. Uh, I'm in favor of Linda McMahon. Uh, but once again, that's a very close race uh, for the nomination now, of the Republican candidate. Now, in your, in your race in the Danbury, larger Danbury area, it seems like there's two Democrats that are vying to run against you. Well, how, do you how do you see your, or how many are there? Well, in the state Senate, uh, I've heard now there are two Democrats that would like to run. Uh, none of them are officially in. Their convention is Monday night. We'll soon find out. I'm hearing there may be a primary on that side of the aisle. Uh, I'm focused on uh, my campaign, and whoever the candidate is, I'll look forward to the debating the issues. Well, listen, speaking of debates, we'd love to have you on Ideas of Work and Beyond. Thank We've you. had video debates in a bunch of different races, and the door is always open. We'd love to have you come in and talk about the issues. Well, I would love to have a debate with my ultimate candidate. I will tell you, two years ago, my opponent refused to debate me, so I, I welcome the opportunity to do that this year. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Appreciate your time. Thanks. thanks. All right, we're here with Andy Vassella, the newly minted Republican nominee from the 4th Congressional District. No stranger to Ideas of Work and Beyond. Dan, you had an overwhelming victory, even in light of my compelling speech. <laughs> and it was. How do you explain that? No, Marty, yo, but we are excited to be taking this out to Jim Himes. You know, he's just been a rubber stamp for Nancy Pelosi. The Republican Party is unified behind a message of small government, free enterprise, and individual liberty. And it's going to be a stark contrast with Jim Himes' rubber stamping of Nancy Pelosi's agenda. Okay, well, there's an open seat for Jim Hines if he has the guts to come on the show and, and debate you like he did in the primary. Best of luck. Thank you, Marty. All right, take care. All right. We got a little RuPaul going. Day two of the convention. You know, there are only a certain times you can wear a shirt like this. We're pulling in WCMX to the convention center. Go. Here we go.
Hartford, Connecticut. Today we decide on the governor. Mike Fidelli. Tom Foley. We'll see what happens. Stay tuned. Ideas of working beyond. Republican convention. Right now the convention is... Leaving the convention, it's very interesting. Tom Foley for governor. Linda McMahon for Senate. Dan DeBiscell, Dan DeBiscella for the 4th Congressional District and um, Sam Caligari. All people that have appeared on our show, do the math on that, is running in the 5th Congressional District. Al Robinson is at the Democratic Convention, and I say, game on. That's all from the Republican Convention. Now I got to go find my car. See you in the studio. It's amazing. Wow, that's some riveting footage there of the Republican Convention. It's oh, actually it's a very real. exciting place to be. Uh, we have on the phone line one of our political uh, analysts, Dave. Dave Strait, are you there? I am here. How are you doing? Good, good, good. What, what is your feedback from uh, uh, the Republican convention? You saw some clips of it there. What do you think of the candidates? Um, they kind of indifferent, to be honest with you. All right. Linda yep. McMahon, let's take her, for example. What are your thoughts on Linda? Um, you know, she knows how to run a business. She's fiscally responsible. I don't think she's a bad candidate. At least she knows whether she served in Vietnam or not. Ooh, shot across the bow there. 
All right, what are, you, what are your thoughts on the other two candidates in that particular race? It was Rob Simmons and Peter Schiff. You might know him because you're in the financial world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't they don't evoke a lot of emotion for me to be honest with you. I think of the candidates. I mean, Linda McMahon is probably going to be uh, one of the better candidates. Okay, last question. This year, this election cycle, do you think it's going to be the inside party politicians that have paid their dues, or are we looking at a year where outsiders like a Linda McMahon are going to come in? And, uh, and steal the show. What are your thoughts? You know, I, I hate to say it, but it's the people that are, are likable that are going to end up winning. Um, the, Ameri- the electorate is perpetually swayed by people that are likable, and that's all it comes down to anymore. It has very little to do with substance. Right. I hate to say it, but that's the way it appears. Hey, can I put in, get in two points? Please, go right ahead. All right, I, I, I told you I wanted to start calling in and just giving you an, an update from the absurd file. Yes. And there were, there were two, uh, two things that really struck me today that were just absolutely insane, and that is when the Democrats proposed a mini-stimulus bill of $200 billion to try and get the, the economy going. <laughs> now, since when is a mini-stimulus Two hundred billion dollars. Yeah. And the second one is um, this is Senator the Republican Bob Corker, uh, Republican from Tennessee, in an effort to try and stem the hemorrhaging and at Fenny at um, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, proposed that borrower, borrowers be required to make a five percent down payment in order to qualify for a home loan. Yeah. That proposal was rejected 57 to 42, and Christopher Dodd said, I quote, passage of such a requirement would restrict home ownership to only those who can afford it. They have lost their minds, Marty. Dave, I thank you for phoning in. When you come up with these facts, you depress me, but it's like cod liver oil. It's tough medicine, but we got to take it. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye. Okay. Well, there you have it. Um, he mentioned something very interesting. Yeah. He mentioned something very interesting. Uh, <laughs> Bob Corker. You know what Bob Corker and Dick Blumenthal have in common? Is this like a joke? No, no, it's not, no, no, it's a, not at all. German and it's no joke at all. Okay. It's no joke at all. Bob Corker was the only Republican freshman in 2006 in the United States Senate. A bad year for the Republicans. Mm-hmm. Dick Blumenthal stands to be the only freshman Democrat in 2010. And that's not my stating that's Charlie Cook, that's, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the name on MSNBC, Chuck Todd, that's all of those folks. Um, Call, are you there? Call, are you there? Yeah, Marty, I have a question for you. Yes. Okay, we have a situation here where after this incident with Blumenthal and being, a, being in Vietnam and all, that kind of hurt him a little bit. But now, according to the latest polls today, it shows that he's about 30 points over Linda McMahon. Republicans can't catch a break. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. I hear you. I hear you. Well, actually, we have our political uh, expert on all things polls. Where he refused, Blumenthal refused to join the lawsuit with 14 or 13 other states, okay? To, to contest come on, come on. to the Supreme <laughs> Court that the, the health care that was imposed on us was illegal. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, Jody Rell agrees with it also with not to do that. So. That's why he was not going to court. All right, oh, listen, God. those are good points. I, I appreciate you bringing them up a lot, and we're going to go right to those polls that you brought up about uh, Linda McMahon, Blumenthal, where they stand now, and uh, how badly was he hurt. I think we have the front cover of the New York Times, and we can roll that. Thanks a lot for the call. Thanks, yeah. Barty. Take care. You too. Okay, yeah, what about that? Uh, well, what about it? is far from fatally injured. Far, far from it. I mean, this Quinnipiac poll is just brutal. It's mm-hmm. absolutely brutal. Look here. Um, and we have some, if we ever want to show a couple of minutes of the video footage, we have Doug, Doug Schwartz, he did a press conference moments ago. I had it, have it on there so we can watch him do his little brief breakdown of what the poll really means. But look, one, Linda McMahon did get no, received no bounce whatsoever from the convention. Two, the whole Vietnam BS, which I, which I call BS for reasons that we don't have enough time to get into, no effect. Uh, they called the state of Connecticut land of steady habits. And when you have 
Richard, Richard Blumenthal killing Linda McMahon, 56 to 31 percent. And you have Linda McMahon's unfavorable numbers, which is just devastating, which had 26 percent, uh, 26 unfavorable March 17th, May 27th, after the Vietnam, after the convention, her negatives go up 13 points. Yeah, that, that doesn't look good. I mean, Al brings up an excellent point. I mean, what I what I think was there was somewhat of a negative bounce from a couple of things. First of all, it looked like I mean, from the Republican standpoint, I mean, it looked like Rob Simmons got bullied out of the race. Yeah, he got screwed. Even he got screwed. Even it's that, plain and simple. Even if you even if you voted for McMahon, you, you felt sympathy for that. I think part partly too is that, uh, and this is where I guess McMahon's operatives failed a little bit was the fact that they went and bragged about the fact that they were the ones that leaked the Vietnam Have you story. ever heard of anything like that before? Well, I, no. And then, and then when people actually went and looked at the whole speech, and I'm not defending what he said. I mean, I think it was wrong for him to have said what he said. I think that he said that it was wrong for him to say what he said. But three times prior to that in the speech, the same speech, he mentions that he didn't serve in Vietnam. So if you look at the whole thing, I mean, this is like a... Uh, this is like a, a, a child that gets sent to the office, and the, they asked him, they asked him what you do, and he didn't tell him all the bad things that he did. He just said that he went to the bathroom without asking permission. Well, just out of and, curiosity, and then, why did the New York Times, which is traditionally known as a left-leaning publication, oh I know you're talking God. about the editorial uh, you, you, you board, drive, not the news. Uh, well, we want to get into that. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. You can't stand me. You drive happened. me nuts when you say here's that. Here's what happened. Okay. The New England office of the New York Times, which operates out of Boston. I believe had been very slow for material. If you look at it, they went a week without about any stories from Connecticut in the New York regional section and everything. So it was a slow news day? It was a slow news week. Not only was it slow, it was the, look, I mean, it was a plant. Like you know what a plant is all about? Hold on, hold on. News. Do you know what a plant is all about? The, the story was yeah, planted. The story was planted yeah, with an edited George video. Bush's, uh, stop, stop. Cause you, you took up a lot of time last week winding on with this stuff. It was a planted story that was planted, an edited video clip planted to a shady reporter, time. the dead news time. And, it, and, and if you look at, if, I don't have enough time to go back to who planted this stuff, but if you know who planted this stuff, it's like uh, Carl Rove Jr. I, I, I'm not going to bring up the person's name and all that stuff because it will just take up way too much time to say who this person was. But it was a hit job from Linda McMahon's campaign. It was already, and it, it it was was already fire too, and I think that's what it was. An edited clip. Process. It was an edited clip. That's so dishonest. I mean, I, I think. And, it, and it didn't, it, it, look, the, the polls right here tells you that people just did not care about that stuff. I mean, even Rob you, Simmons, you, who dropped out of the race, and everybody was oh told to answer this poll, he's still You're, drawing a quarter of the vote almost. Drawing. Look, uh, uh, Richard Blumenthal. His, I mean, fa his favorability. His, his, his favorability. His favorables amongst Republicans is at forty-one percent. Forty-one percent. Independents, Among amongst Republicans, independents, 58 percent. Linda McMahon is brutal, brutal. I mean, she, she, her unfavorables went up 13 way, points. The for the viewers at home is a Quinnipiac. Quinnipiac right? poll. It's uh, online. Yeah. If you look at the, if you go to Real Clear Politics, this is the largest sampling that's been done in the Senate race to date. Yes. About, about 1,500 and change. And we, I, should, I should say also, this is, these are registered voters, not likely voters. Registered voters are basically people who probably... Haven't you know? There's there's a chance they might not vote in the primary. Likely voters are people who are most likely will vote in the primary. It sounded very proportional to the Republicans, Democrats, unaffiliated. Yes. When I looked at the numbers, unaffiliated being the largest block, Democrats not too many less, and then Republicans. Yes. Um, if you want, we can do a, like two or three minutes and just show Doug Schwartz talk about this and just break yeah, it all down. You, know, you, you wouldn't do it justice though, because you really need well, to. Well, just give him his, give his opening remarks. He did a press conference. He talked about the whole thing. Um, hey, uh, Dave, if, you, uh, if, if, you, if you're back there, dude, um, the, 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 video, the video's called uh, Poll. Uh, just switch to that thing real quick and run that thing. And, and Doug basically breaks down um, what this is all about, because it's not good for Republicans. You should not have put your eggs into somebody like McMahon. It, it, he clearly says right here, Doug Schwartz, the more people get to know Linda McMahon, the less they like her. And that's amongst Republicans. Not good. It's, 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 it's absolutely the truth. I mean, and you see people that have a chance like Dandy Basso, like Sam Calagiri and stuff. You will not see them associate themselves with McMahon in the fall campaign, I predict. Even if she's the nominee, they'll run on their own. They, they, Republicans are fortunate to have three good candidates for governor. I would say that they be that, that don't draw a lot of negatives right now, um, and I think that they'll attach themselves to them. I think there'll be a very big distancing job from Linda McMahon that come this fall. Um, I mean, I, I know. I mean, yeah, they'd like her check, but they wouldn't like her uh, on their campaign ad. It doesn't sound like. Um, 
while he's looking for that, I mean, I don't know if we well, let's talk a little bit about the race for governor. I guess why don't we? Why don't we sure. Talk about that? Uh, we we can switch gears to that. In the video clip, we saw Tom Foley at the moment that he knew that he won the convention. Um, but we also have Mike Fidelli, who has uh, um, you know thrown in his lot with Mark Bowden oh. as his lieutenant governor oh. candidate. And uh, and I think that uh, both of them now Mike Fidelli is going to be. Uh, um, uh, running a primary. If we had that, if we had that videotape back to the Democrats, so let's roll the video. I'm Doug Schwartz, the director of the Quinnipiac University poll. I'd like to share with you the results from our latest poll that was conducted over this past Monday and Tuesday with over 1,000 Connecticut registered voters. The poll is good news for Richard Blumenthal. He retains a commanding lead over Linda McMahon in his race for senator. He leads McMahon by 25 points. Uh, he has been hurt somewhat by the Vietnam controversy, but not that much. Uh, in our last poll two months ago, he was leading McMahon by 33 points, so that lead has dropped eight points in our poll today. Um, I can also, yes. Plus or minus three, right? Yes, the margin of error on this poll is much plus or minus three points. In terms of Linda McMahon's favorability, uh, her negatives have gone up since our last poll. Uh, she has not gotten a bounce out of her convention victory. Her negatives are up 13 points. Uh, in our last poll, 26% of Connecticut voters had an unfavorable opinion of her. Today, 39% do. When you say negatives, what do you mean by negatives? The negative opinion of her, her unfavorables. So when we ask uh, voters, do you have a favorable, unfavorable opinion of that candidate or haven't heard enough? So when I say her negatives, I'm talking about the percentage that has an unfavorable opinion. So the more they hear, what happens? The more that they have found out about Linda McMahon, the less they like her. Do you ask specifically? Sorry, go ahead. You didn't have any specific questions that would really get to what is driving that negative number up, right? Uh, the specific questions that we asked were on uh, experience, on does she care about the needs and, uh, and problems of people like you, uh, is she honest and trustworthy? Does she have strong leadership qualities? On all of those measures, uh, Blumenthal does much better than McMahon. The, wo the one that really struck me as, as really standing out as a problem for McMahon is does she have the right kind of experience to be a U.S. Senator from Connecticut? On that one, as we found in the past, most Connecticut voters say, no, she doesn't have the right kind of experience to be a U.S. Senator from Connecticut. Is there anywhere in the poll where you ask her experience with the WWE? Is that, the, is that asked specifically? We did last time, not in this poll. Um, but it, it, it has not helped her. At least that's what we found in our last poll. And when we asked specifically about people's image of the WWE in our last poll two months ago, uh, they had a negative opinion overall so of, of the WWE. The so-called national trend about people wanting somebody outside of government, and which is the thrust of her marketing campaign, isn't working here. It's not working right now. She hasn't gotten very much for her $15 million that she spent. Do you find Blumenthal's lead um, surprising in light of the mountain of negative press he received last week nationally? No, you're right. Uh, that Blumenthal certainly got a lot of bad press last week. It was a very difficult week for him, but despite all that bad press, uh, he remains very popular. Uh, people know the Attorney General, they like the Attorney General, and they appear to be giving him, uh, they appear to be cutting him some slack on this controversy. The McMahon campaign calls your poll odd and curious. Do you find it so or not? Uh, no, I, I, I don't. Well, the Rasmussen polls right. showed them three points apart. Their own polls show them 15 points apart. Yours, I mean, I don't need to do a larger, a larger sample. Is that the only difference? Uh, timing is also important on this story. Uh, we waited a week after the controversy. I believe the Rasmussen poll was conducted immediately after the uh, controversy broke last week. So you didn't time, start yeah, I think it came out the next day or the day after. Right. Two you days didn't start ago. polling till Monday? That's right. Tell me more after about the this post-convention bounce or right. non-bounce. Uh, we didn't see a electorate. bounce. Co correct. I'm with you. You didn't see a bounce. But the electric ha had enough time to um, swallow and understand and hear about it? 
Um, I think so. I mean, it was well covered in the in the press over the weekend. Uh, so Malloy got no convention bounce either. We didn't see any bounce from Malloy or or for Foley. Give us the Republican and Democrat well, analysis. Question about the, the, but go ahead, guys. Uh, I, I, on the governor's race. On the governor's race, uh, Foley continues to lead in the Republican primary over Fideli and Griebel. However, there's still a very large uh, number of Republicans that are undecided. In fact, that is the largest group on the Republican. Side. On the Democratic side, uh, Lamont continues to lead Malloy, but again, uh, large undecided there. Um, you know, on the Republican side, we have a very uh, good, good. Good evening, and welcome back. Well, there you have it. Uh, the polls, I would, I would say, in the uh, inner workings of the Linda McMahon campaign, they would have probably preferred to have a bigger bounce coming out of the convention. They must be concerned about the negatives, and this is what happens when you have a tough battle within your party. You're tearing each other down, and sometimes those negatives can spill over. And it would appear that uh, Attorney General Blumenthal has weathered the storm of his comments, and as some would say enhancing his... Uh, his military uh, record during the Vietnam era, not to be confused with actually fighting in Vietnam. Uh, but that's the Senate race. We want to turn the page here to the governor's race, and it was very interesting because you have Tom Foley, uh, uh, essentially a, a blue blood, if you will, from Greenwich, Connecticut, a former ambassador to Ireland, uh, who is uh, going against Mike Fidelli, who, by the way, never did get the uh, blessing or the endorsement of the sitting governor, Governor Rell, and some people have wondered about that, and a veritable outsider who came in and acquitted himself very well, and that was Oz Breville. But Matt, what are your thoughts on the governor's race? Well, I have to say, on the Republican side, that was the most polite, genuine race of the convention. All three worked to get their name out. They talked about what they would do as governor. They talked about how they would do it, agree, disagree, or whatever. They didn't go after each other. There was no attacking. There was no punching. There was no uh, anything like that, any of the dirty stuff that we saw in the United States Senate race and a couple of the races uh, for Congress. And I think that in the end, I mean, definitely, did Tom Foley's money have an advantage? Yes, absolutely. There's no Do you question. have any idea how much he spent in, the, in that race? I, I know the $14 no, million no, but it's, it, No, but it's, it, it's not. What's interesting about Tom is that he's raised so much as much, much as he's spent. So he's out there raising money. People are actually giving to his campaign, unlike Linda McMahon, who has raised less than $10,000 in Connecticut. I mean, about half of Tom's money that he's spent has been raised... Um, uh, has been raised from fundraisers, some in Connecticut, obviously, some from, he's got contacts all over the country. Mm -hmm. But it was a gentlemanly race. So Tom Foley is rich and, and I, he has rich friends. And I think that that the governor's race in the Republican side is going to be a very extended, in-depth job interview with these three guys in the Republican Party as to who's going to be the best. Mm -hmm. In, um, in uh, the Democratic convention, I mean, Ned Lamont, I think, is definitely the front runner in the race. But you have to remember, I mean, they didn't choose him by about a 65 35 margin. But I think the reason for that is you've got to remember the party leadership did not support Mr. Lamont four years ago when he ran for the United States Senate. And he won a primary that had probably the highest turnout in the history of Democratic primaries outside of a presidential race in this state. I don't expect that to turn out this time because Senator Lieberman is not on the ballot. But mm -hmm. you've got to remember there's an angry group of Democrats out there that have voted for Mr. Lamont and are remorseful that he didn't win that Senate race four mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. Those people would go through hurricanes to vote for Ned Lamont. I'm not knocking Dan Malloy at all, but I think Lamont starts out with a bigger base in this primary. People always expected him to be in this primary. They didn't necessarily expect him to be party endorsement. But if you met, I mean, Ned Lamont probably, good, bad, or indifferent, has the highest name recognition of any of the gubernatorial candidates at this point. Absolutely, yeah. yeah I think, right, I think uh, you're, yeah, you were at the convention. What was the sense of it? Um, well, everybody knew that Dan Malloy was going to win this thing. He's been campaigning for governor since he lost in 2006, and that's not a knock. So it was out by this point. And, so. and that's not a knock on Dan. Um, but y you knew going in that he was the person who was going to get the he was going to get the uh, the nomination. Uh, you knew that Ned well, Lamont was standing part. and you knew Ned Lamont was going to get his 15 percent. It was without question he was going to get those. Um, Going forward, what we see here is that you, you, you have Ned Lamont, obviously he is the front runner right now. Dan Malloy is doing what he can to point to the fact that Ned Lamont is self-financing his campaign. Um, he's against sick pay, sick pay leave. He's, he's, uh, he's trying to bring up negatives about, Dan, uh, about Ned, and we'll see if that works or not. I don't know. 
but um, it, hopefully, what I'm hoping is less of the negativity, and I want to see more of just these two, two guys talking about the issues, as we see, to some extent, on the Republican side, I went to the gubernatorial forum that was in Ridgefield. For the most part, you know, Foley took a couple of jabs at Fideli, which is pretty funny, and, and, and I think he'll take a few more, seeing that Fideli can't get the endorsement of his, his boss. But for the most part, it was very, they told you exactly what they want to do if they are elected. I'd like to see more of that out of the two Democratic candidates, and hopefully we will as time goes forward. Ned Lamont and Tom Foley both live in Greenwich, <coughs> Connecticut. They're both independently wealthy. I mean, what does it say about the state that you have someone like a Mike Fideli, who kind of uh, grew up in, uh, I won't say underprivileged, he came from a fine home, but he really was a self-made man, uh, built his company, a man of the people. He's already served in government. What does it say about our state that we tend to go for moneyed outsiders that come in? Well, Mike, Mike, Mike Fideli is part of a problem Mike Fideli has right now is he's the only one of the five gubernatorial candidates in this primary, two Democrats, three Republicans, that is coming out of Hartford right now, mm -hmm. when Hartford has some of the highest negatives that it's ever had. Anything that comes out of Hartford is not good. Unfortunately for Mike, he's perceived as being in the thick of it, being a, uh, Lieutenant Governor to Jody Rell, being part of what's wrong in the state right now, which is state government. I don't think that that's true. I think a lot of it's unwarranted. I don't think he's been allowed to be the type of person that he really is as lieutenant governor. But he's the only one that you can point to being a Hartford insider right now. Dan Malloy has been mayor of Stanford for 12 years before, until last year. He's, a, uh, he's not part of what's going on in Hartford. Mm -hmm. Ned Lamont definitely is not. Tom Foley is not. Oz Griebel is not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, none of those guys are part of Hartford right so, now. So do you think when it's all said and done, this coming November, it's going to be an outsider's year? Do you think uh, incumbents and uh, people that are a, a member of the party that's in power now are in trouble? Yes and no. I, I, think, that, I think that the Republicans do have an advantage in the gubernatorial race, and no matter what happens. And here's why. It's a sitting Republican who's leading office. Um, Connecticut has always preferred divided government. When Bill O'Neill, the a Democrat, was governor, we had a re the red I checked the registration numbers. They're not much different than they are today. Mm. We had a Republican legislature. Right. When Weicker was governor, we had a Republican Senate and a Democrat House. Throughout most of Roland and Jody's time, we've had a Democrat legislature. I think Connecticut voters prefer divided government. I, I think that that's what you're going to see come come this fall. Plus, I think that again, uh, and I'll refer back to it, uh, and then let Al go, is um, the Democratic race right now is shaping up to be a very nasty primary for governor. The Republican race, it has not taken that turn yet. I'm not saying that it couldn't, but I've yet to see it. So Foley, I, I, uh, I mean, Malloy and Ned Lamont, that could get nasty? It did at the convention, it, I think. It, it did. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to show the video footage from the Democratic convention, but it was pretty, um, I don't want to say nasty, but you know, it wasn't it wasn't what I, was, I expect, and I, again, I hope we, as we go forward with the two Democrats, that we can talk about the issues and less about the personal uh, personalities. Um, the problem with Fideli is, look, man, he was he was Jody Rell's number two. He's Jody Rell's number two, and 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 you look at the Quinnipiac poll, 78 percent of the po polling Republicans don't know anything or haven't heard enough about the guy. Um, that's a problem. That's a problem. The fact that that Governor Rell didn't even endorse. Her number two. Uh, that 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 speaks I, volumes. Couldn't that be that that she is gracefully exiting the stage and uh, she wants to leave it up to the the party uh, well, well, membership? <laughs> Fidelity was part of the Jody team. If you like Jody, you should go for Fidelity. That's one. Of, that's one of the things that I don't quite understand. Well, I mean, if if you like the if you like the Jody team, well, Fidelity was number two. If you like that, you want more of the same. Keep going. If everybody keeps loving Jody Rowell, Mike Fidelity's right there. You know, it just it seems a little odd. I, I didn't quite understand that, and I don't understand how he's polling so bad uh, against Foley. I mean, not as bad as he is. I, mean, I understand that Foley's got money, he's been on TV, blah blah blah. But Fidelity's not doing good. His numbers are low. For for a sitting lieutenant governor. For a, for a, for a, yeah. I mean, I, but I think it's, it's wide open. I, I think that there's going to be a very good job interview um, in the Republican side. The Democrats, I'm, I'm, one of the things I'm afraid about with the Democrats, and I, I don't say this is good or bad to anybody, is I think uh, Malloy may be in the position of having Ned Lamont define Dan Malloy. And I don't think that that's good. I think that he's got enough money and he's got enough influence within the party that his opponent's going to define him. And I think it's a big disadvantage for Malloy. He fell into the trap against John DeStefano four years ago for that reason. He allowed DeStefano to define him. And right now, from everything that I see among the Democratic Party faithful, Malloy is allowing Lamont to define. And I think something else you got to consider, you got to be a little concerned about. See, if you see Malloy and Lamont just go at it and go at it all the time, they're going to suck the oxygen out of the room. 
And the Republicans are not going to have any time to get in the limelight unless Foley goes after Fidelity or Fidelity goes after Foley. At some point in time, they're going to have to raise their ID a little, a little bit and get to be, to be known out there. People know Dan Malloy. People definitely know Ned Lamont. Looking at these Q polls, which is a snapshot of what's happening right now, people somewhat know Foley because he's been on TV, but they don't really know anything about him. And people are just telling you by 78% they don't know anything about Fidelity. A final thought I'll give on the governor's race is watch Oz Griebel. He's yeah. going to be down there on row C by himself. He came into that convention. He had only been in the race 24 days and got almost 24 percent. Like him a lot. Convention. Like him a lot. Watch him. Yeah, he was an appealing candidate. Okay, lightning mm -hmm. round here. I want predictions. Senate race on the Republican side. Uh, any any problems for McMahon in a, in a primary? Yeah, it's, 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 it's more people learn about McMahon, and more people the more people are not going to like McMahon. Oh, Necrophilia, okay. well, sex, violence, all that stuff is going to come out. It's going to look ugly, and some of the stuff she did for the Democrats back in the day, it's not going to look good for her. Qualifications to hold the office. She lost. She won, yeah, her well, negatives went up 13 what are, points. What are the, what are, what's the possibility that another Republican jumps in and somehow? I think it, I think it very well could. And who's that person? Uh, could be uh, we don't know yet. Could be, could very well be. Tea Party vote. He can get that Tea Party vote. He can. Shepard, who are you talking about? Uh, we don't know yet. I mean, uh, who, who knows? It's, it's, there's, there's a lot of time left. All right. And then uh, last, we'll close with the uh, governor's race on the Republican side. Foley, Fidelity, Greenwood. Uh, I think it's wide open right now. Tom does have the edge coming out of the convention. So one for Foley? Uh, I'm going to say Foley at this time. Fidelity's got to get out there and make the case. He's got to go out there and start making some noise. A lot of time left. A lot of time left. All the viewers, it's, good. it's an exciting political season in this state. We've actually, uh, uh, with Blumenthal and some other things, have led the national news. So all eyes are on Connecticut. It's a microcosm of what's going on both in our economy and in the political uh, air. So please, by all means, get out and get to know these candidates and make a decision. Because this year, unlike any other year, your vote is really, really going to count in these primaries and also in the general election. So thanks a lot for watching. We'll have something more next week, 9 to 10 p.m. here on Channel 23. And join us. Here's a great Good night.